Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to our Landwatch webinar, How to Build Affordable Housing on Religious Property. My name is Michael DeLapa, and I'm the Executive Director of Landwatch Monterey County. Thank you very much for joining us. Over the next hour, my three panelists and I will explain how religious institutions can help solve California's housing crisis and at the same time contribute to addressing the climate crisis. As you can see, we are recording the webinar so we can share it with a broader audience. We will also share all the slides that we present. We hope to have time at the end of the webinar for your questions. Please use Zoom's chat function to write down your question and we'll do our best to answer them. And please make sure to mute yourself now so we can hear our, our speakers. Here's our agenda for the next hour. I'll make some introductions and talk briefly about the connection between housing, climate, and equity. The Reverend Penny Nixon will talk about the why and how of housing on religious lands. John Farrow will cover Senate Bill 4, the actual law, and Jake Medcalf will get into the nuts and bolts of building. So today I'm really delighted be, to be uh, joined by three affordable housing experts. The Reverend Penny Nixon served as the senior minister of the Congregational Church of San Mateo from 2007 to 2022. She was the first woman to hold that position and with her leadership, her congregation thrived as a vibrant, progressive spiritual community, became known for its work in social justice, received the MLK award from the County of San Mateo and became a sanctuary church. Currently, Penny works as the faith director with the Housing Leadership Council of San Mateo and as the faith community's housing liaison for the County of San Mateo. John Farrow serves as Landwatch's legal counsel. John has practiced land use, water, and environmental law for 20 years. John and his partner, Mark Wolf, have represented Landwatch in these areas since 2005. With the help of Reverend Penny and Reverend Jake, John San Mateo Church is now studying providing affordable housing on its campus. Jake Medcalf is the co-founder of Firm Foundation Community Housing, an all-in-one service provider that works on every aspect of creating a tiny home village on religious properties. Most recently, Jake served as the lead pastor for First Presbyterian Church of Hayward. Jake is passionate about serving the local community and providing creative and innovative housing solutions for those most in need. A few words about Landwatch Monterey County. Our mission is to inspire Californians to create a sustainable and equitable future. To us, sustainability means net, carb net zero net carbon. To achieve that, we aim to change the land use patterns that contribute to global warming. In California, 40% of our greenhouse gases come from transportation. To get to net zero carbon, we need to make it easier for people to get to their jobs without cars. In Monterey County, that means building more housing on the Monterey Peninsula and reducing the number of workers commuting from the Salinas Valley. By educating and mobilizing local residents, we aim to move all Monterey County jurisdictions to net zero carbon and serve as a model for the rest of California. You can find a lot more information about the connection between climate and housing on the Landwatch website. Now, equity is also in our DNA. To, equi to us, equitable means fair. Our country has a sad history of unfair land practices, including redlining, which prevented minority families from purchasing homes in certain neighborhoods. Exclusive single family zoning that prevents multifamily apartments is another example of discriminatory land practices. For many years, I lived in New Monterey where apartments, multifamily homes, mixed use commercial and residential buildings and small lot single family homes exist side by side. That is the kind of integrated communities we should strive for. So we're gonna be talking today a lot about affordability. Here are the affordability ranges uh, excuse me, tiers based on household size and income for Monterey County residents. The range is very large. A single individual making roughly $24,000 qualifies as extremely low income, and a household of five making about $117,000 qualifies as moderate income. 
As I mentioned, we'll share all of our slides with you in a follow-up email, so you'll have this. I have an hour presentation on the economics of housing, but I'm going to spare that uh, and try to summarize everything I would tell you in three slides. The first important point is that over the past 20 years, California has not built enough housing, not nearly enough housing to accommodate its population. As you can see from this chart, our housing numbers, our production numbers have been really, really low. But undersupply is only a part of the story. The data show Monterey County doesn't have a, a supply shortage. It also has a shortage of housing that is affordable to local working families. Our local agencies have approved more than 23,000 residential dwelling units in Monterey County, but those units haven't been built. Of those units, almost all of them are single family homes and hardly any apartments have been built or approved for years. By design, most of the housing in Monterey County is for very high income households because it's single family housing. Consider these statistics. A median household income in Monterey County is roughly $80,000. A rough rule of thumb is that an affordable home is two and a half times median income, or in our county, that would be 200,000. But the median price of a house in Monterey County today is a million dollars. That means there is an enormous gap between what the average working family in Monterey County earns and what housing that family can afford. Most of the housing, again, is single family housing, and that is simply not affordable to our community. So now I would like to turn the program over to the Reverend Penny Nixon, who's going to talk about the spiritual imperative of providing affordable housing. Penny? Thanks, Michael, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for your interest and uh, for joining this webinar. Um, I left uh, being a pastor in June of 2022, and one of the reasons is because I wanted to do social justice work full time. And as I was looking for what was next, everything that I looked at somehow intersected with housing and afford affordability, whether it was racial justice, economic inequality, um, and so on and so on, education. So um, I feel very passionate about um, having more affordable homes built and also to as permanent supportive housing as one of the proven solutions to solving homelessness. And I believe as this slide says that we can use the power that we have as faith communities. And I know there's a lot of different kinds of folks on the line. So um, um, those of you in faith communities, I'm speaking particularly to you, but I'm hopeful this is helpful to everyone on the call. Um, we have the power as faith communities to advocate and to organize um, and to now, especially as John will talk about in a few minutes with SB4 and all the other 56 uh, housing bills that passed through the California legislature this year um, to create affordable homes for very low income people. And I believe that the time is right and everything is aligned for the faith communities to be hopefully uh, a key contributor to solving homelessness and also, which is also to build more affordable housing. Next slide, please. Faith communities can be part of the solution because we can explore the opportunities to provide affordable housing. A lot of us in faith communities and congregations have underutilized land and that can be used, and Jake's gonna talk about that, to build affordable housing. And if we really come together as faith communities across the state and each in our own counties, we can actually move the needle. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. The other thing we can do if we're a faith leader in a community is help recruit our landlords in our congregations to participate in voucher programs. That's that's really a, a key help and something that is dramatically missing, at least in San Mateo County it is. Um, we can bridge community members in need to services. A lot of faith communities are on the front lines of a lot of what's going on socially. A lot of folks show up at our doors needing help. We can be that bridge. And we can also partner. We can partner with our governments, with our counties, with our local cities to educate people around homelessness and the housing challenges. Uh, education is, is really key. Next slide, please. 
So what gifts do the faith communities bring? I'd like to offer just a few things for you to think about. First of all, lots of churches are land rich and cash poor, right? Uh, but we have a prized possession and that is land. Um, and most, most of us wanna stick around and serve our communities. And also sometimes it can be worked out where it's a great gift to the community and a gift to the congregation. And also um, many of our congregations are located in high resourced areas with lots of amenities, some near transit, and that really makes a difference. So we have something that's crucial, which is land. And um, many congregations are not thriving, uh, at least in San Mateo County. And um, there's a way to leave a legacy. Uh, next slide, please because the legacy we can leave is very much aligned with our tradition, whatever faith tradition you're from, the scriptural and spiritual teachings about land, about shelter, about loving your neighbor, and about a just economy are, are peppered throughout all our sacred texts, the caring for our neighbor. And we also have, many of us, a long tradition of giving back to our communities. We're trusted messengers, people come to us, and we have something that we can offer. Um, lots of congregations have offered, you know, blankets and food and water and clothing. And, and now it's time, I think, to offer homes and housing. Next slide, please. Another gift that I think we bring to this is, you know, churches, community, congregations are community. That's why a lot of people are attracted to faith communities because they provide a sense of belonging. Well, affordable housing is really creating communities of belonging. It's not just about a house, it's a home, it's a village, it's a community. It's where people feel like they, they can belong. And that's something that we already know how to do. It's something that most congregations do well, whether they're big congregations or small congregations. Next slide. Building affordable housing on congregational land is also very much aligned missionally with most congregations. We're called to be good stewards of our resources and whatever tradition you're from, you probably know the Good Samaritan story. We're called to be good Samaritans and we're called to be good innkeepers as well. And we are called to do justice. And one of the greatest injustices across our state is housing injustice. I mean, how is it, friends, that we live in one of the richest nations in the world and there are hundreds of thousands of people living on our streets? How is that? We're called as people of faith and as human beings to, to make a difference and to do our part. We can't solve everything, but we can be a viable part of proven solutions to ending homelessness and ending ending what is just so many families are cost burdened. They're choosing between healthy food for their families and paying their rent. And we have to do something, our part in making a better society for all. As we all know, the inequities in most of our counties, in most of our cities and across the state continue to grow between the wealthy and the poor and, and the middle are often getting, you know, I mean, jo Michael showed us that slide about annual median income and the median price of housing. So we're called to do something. Next slide, please. So I think the top priorities are that we should support the production of affordable housing and take a look at your congregational land if you're part of a faith community. If you're part of a city, look around and see where there is land on religious property and build a relationship, ask people about it. And then also another thing that we can do is to be greater advocates for expanding the avail availability of rental subsidies, advocates for more affordable housing. I cannot emphasize enough how important it is for faith leaders and faith communities to show up at city council meetings, to show up at the board of supervisors of your county and to advocate. Because I will tell you this, the voices in opposition that often are the loudest, they're the ones who show up. And if we want our elected 
to do the right thing, we have to support them. And we have to show up to those places and support them and support more affordable housing. And that takes education, it takes spiritual will, and it takes um, us coming together. And so I really believe that there's a there's a saying in, in my tradition, the Christian tradition, um, there's two concepts of time. One is chronos, chronological time, and the other is kairos, which is means a time that is a moment of opportunity. And I think this is our Kairos moment as congregations across the state of California to come together in this moment of opportunity. Our elected officials have opened a gateway for us. And it's our responsibility, I would suggest, to walk through that gate and to be part of the solutions to ending homelessness and to building more affordable housing. Thanks. Oh, sorry, I have more slides. I thought I was done. I almost said amen. So let me just keep continue really quickly. This is an example of a church in Walnut Creek, uh, St. Paul's Episcopal, where they built housing. You can see on the left, that's the sanctuary. And on the right, the affordable housing that was built. It's for extremely low income, which is one of the greatest needs that we have. And they have a center, it's called Trinity Center there, um, and they did this through a series of partnerships and it takes a lot to make this happen and they were able to make it happen. They're a great example of what can be done. Next slide. And I am working, I'm a project manager and Jake's firm is our developer. We're working um, at St. James AME Zion Church in an underrepresented neighborhood in the city of San Mateo. Um, on a project that will either be four units, it might be five now, we're just um, looking at other options. And those units on a, on a um, 5,600 square foot lot, we're, we're going to be able to put about five units in, and that will be reserved for youth transitioning out of the foster care system. So it's five units only, but what it can do is we're hopefully a model, a pilot, for what congregations across the state can do. It's not a lot of land, but getting six transitioning age youth from the foster system into permanent housing, supportive housing, keeps those six young people, uh, it lowers their risk of homelessness dramatically. And so that's just one example and the St. Paul's example, and then Jake's going to tell you about some other really great examples. Do I have a next slide? I don't. So let me end with this. In October, we did a faith summit on affordable housing on faith lands, creating communities of belonging. We had a panel and Jake happened to be on that panel. And one of the questions that was asked was, where does affordable housing intersect with your faith? And Jake just said, I can't think of a place where it doesn't intersect with my faith. And so I wanna leave that with you, faith leaders on this call, people that are part of faith communities. Affordable housing intersects everywhere in our own faith and what we, what we and who we are called to be. And I'm hoping that this will be an inspiration for all of you to think about that. Thanks. All right, I guess I'm up next. Um, I wanna give you all a um, quick overview of, of SB4, which is the uh, new law that's prompted us to um, get this webinar together. Um, uh, there are three key features to SB4, um, and um, they are that it permits um, by right permitting uh, of uh, qualified development projects. It allows residential use regardless of your zoning. And it overrides the local density and height limits so that you can build um, more than you would otherwise be allowed to. The key feature here is by right permitting. Um, and what is that? 
Normally, when you develop a project, um, there are a number of uh, discretionary reviews that uh, start with a zoning administrator, maybe go to the planning commission, maybe go to the city council, depending on the level of opposition you get from uh, your concerned neighbors. Um, uh, and the discretionary permitting process uh, is uh, often subject to um, quirky and, and difficult to discern in advance uh, um, standards. And of course, it would be also subject to review uh, for environmental impacts under the California Environmental Quality Act. Um, I'm a big fan of CEQA, but I'm not a big fan of using it to stop infill projects. Um, so by right permitting dispenses with uh, the discretionary review. Um, you're subject only to objective standards uh, and there won't be uh, CEQA. The reason you don't need CEQA is because this applies in infill areas where um, the, the prospects of uh, environmental impacts are very limited. And as we'll see, uh, only qualifying sites would work anyway. Next slide. Uh, qualifying developers and projects. Uh, local public entities are uh, qualified, uh, but really the focus of SB4 is uh, churches and their developers. Um, higher education institutions are also subject to this, but our focus today is to talk about churches. So that's what I'm gonna focus on. Uh, qualifying development projects are residential projects. Um, you may have a mixed use project, but at least two thirds of it has to be residential. And the key feature is that it has to be 100% affordable with two exceptions. One, you can have up to 20% that would be for moderate income families, and you can have up to 5% of your units for uh, your own staff. But the focus of this is uh, affordable housing. Next slide. As I mentioned, uh, SB4 overrides uh, local standards regarding development intensity. Um, if you're in a residential zone, and lots of churches are, um, you're allowed the so-called Mullen density, which is um, the density that's been deemed to be required to, to do affordable units. And in Monterey County, that's 20 units per acre. You're also allowed to go one story over uh, the local um, height limit, which is uh, a key way of getting to those densities. If you're in a non-residential zone, you're allowed 40 units per acre. So um, the densities uh, allowed here are significantly higher than uh, you would be allowed under the local um, permitting schemes. Next slide. Parking is also uh, eased. Um, the requirement um, can be no more than one unit per uh, one 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 space per par, uh, per unit, uh, and uh, if the local zoning standard is less, then that applies. And you don't have to provide parking at all if you're within half a mile of uh, qualifying transit or uh, car share. And uh, eliminating parking is a key way to uh, keep the cost of uh, development down and to maximize the number of units. Uh, next slide. You're allowed to have some qualifying non-residential uses, even though you're getting a by right permit. Um, this is a tricky area and I don't wanna to get too deeply into it, but you can continue existing religious institutional uses and existing um, uses that may have been permitted uh, on a discretionary basis, as long as you don't increase them. Um, and you can also uh, include other uh, new uses. This would be the one third of the project that would be um, the mixed use uh, portion if, if the uses are on the ground floor and uh, they don't require, uh, they aren't the kind of uses that would normally require a discretionary permit. Uh, next slide. The qualifying sites uh, are based on the uh, SB 35, which is uh, another law that was written by um, uh, Scott Weiner, the uh, author of SB 4. Um, SB 35 has was set up to enable uh, by right permitting uh, of housing uh, that contains a lot of affordable um, um, units in uh, cities um, based on by right permitting. Um, and uh, it, it only applies in cities that haven't met their uh, share of regional housing needs allocation, which in California is about 90% of cities. Um, uh, SB 35 is uh, was um, greatly contested uh, and it is now uh, the law. It's slowly being implemented and it is the model that SB4 is based on with regard to qualifying sites and the permitting process. So what sites qualify? They have to be infill sites, uh, which means that they either have to be in a city uh, or they have to be in a uh, census defined urbanized uh, cluster area if they're not in, uh, if they're in the unincorporated county. 
They have to be largely surrounded by urban uses and they can't be in an environmentally sensitive area. So not in habitat areas, not in fire zones. And this is why uh, CEQA review is um, arguably not required. Um, and then there's some other requirements, including uh, they can't be too close to industrial or air polluting uses. Um, there are some very minor requirements for um, something that sounds like environmental review, but it's very simple. It's uh, uh, checking for hazmat and uh, checking for tribal resources. This is um, relatively straightforward and is nothing like the uh, full bore sequel review. Uh, next slide. The key thing here is that the application and approval process is fast. Uh, it's based also on SB 35. Um, you submit an application um, and the local government has to respond within 60 days to tell you whether or not your project is consistent with objective planning standards. And um, they have to tell you within 90 days whether your project is consistent with objective design standards. And if there's any question about that, um, uh, the courts have your back. Uh, they've put their thumb on the scale in terms of what constitutes consistency. And uh, the definition of consistency is very favorable to um, housing proponents. So uh, that's it in a nutshell. Um, I can answer questions about it later, but in sum, um, it's SB4 is a, a really valuable new tool for affordable housing. Uh, again, its key features are gonna drive down uh, permitting and construction costs, the buy right permitting based on objective standards, results in permits that'll be issued in months rather than years. The ability to override local zoning will permit housing in any faith-based land, regardless where it is and regardless how it's zoned. And the override of local density will allow you to build enough units to make a difference. So these features coupled with our free land <laughs> should enable our churches to provide desperately needed affordable housing. And we think that in this process, our churches will also be modeling an important benefit uh, of permitting infill housing development by right. This is something that should be expanded, um, can be expanded uh, to include uh, other kinds of uh, housing initiatives and not just faith-based, but I think the churches can be uh, great leaders here. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, John. And now our next speaker is the Reverend Jake Metcalf with Firm Foundation Community Housing. And Jake's gonna share his experience building affordable housing projects on religious properties. Go take it away, Jake. Uh, <clears throat> Jake's gonna share all the mistakes he's made and the bumps and bruises that he's had along the way. I mean, that's what Jake is gonna share. Uh, my story begins as the lead pastor at Firm Found, sorry, lead pastor at First Pres Hayward um, we really got neck deep in the, in the housing crisis by serving the unsheltered. So as part of that, the minute you become friends with and, and do life with as a faith community, those who are without a home, you recognize quickly how important that home is. Um, I think my passion comes from a couple of things. Uh, one of which is, uh, during my season at first press Hayward, uh, I did, um, one too many, which is too many uh, candlelight vigils for our unsheltered community who passed away on the streets from from weather. Um, we in California, you know this, ha have over 175,000 people now. If you count the point in time count, most people in the space will say you add 50%, so more like 220. Um, we have 220,000 people who will be sleeping on the streets tonight and who will be exposed to weather. Uh, and trauma. And that's simply, no matter what faith tradition you stem from, not acceptable. Uh, I don't know, even outside of a faith thought process, it's just a moral imperative. And, you know, like the United Nations took a good hard look at the Bay Area, primarily Oakland, and said, this, this is a, a civil rights issue. Like housing is a human right. And so you get in the middle of that. Firm Foundation exists. It's a launch off of First Press Hayward. We um, built six tiny homes. It took us two and a half years, multiple trips to the county, multiple hard lessons learned. And as we built those in February of 2020, we did a ribbon cutting. Uh, you can go to the next slide. The uh, Turner Center, um, I'll give you some, some stats from Alameda County real quick. That's 9,007 people in Alameda County, which is where I live in. Go to the next slide. I'll leave it right there. The Turner Center 
came out with a report, the Berkeley Center for Housing. I said, essentially, they did a map of all of California. So you can get Monterey County. I'm sorry, I didn't have time to do it. Um, and you can get any idea of how much land is available on faith-based communities. And here it is in Alameda County. You have 46 million square feet of unused church land in Alameda County. I'm going to guess it's something similar in Monterey County, maybe a little bit less due to the nature of like the density of Alameda County. But all we need as firm foundation community housing is 20% of that number. That's it. We don't need all of it. We just need literally one in five faith communities to say yes. And so what Firm Foundation Community Housing did, what we did as we launched it was we went to uh, faith community leaders that were local. We went to the rabbis, the imams, the priests, the pastors, and we asked them, what would it take to turn your no, not in our surplus land? Uh, and by the way, I, I think when it comes to land, we don't always need land. We've got this wrong, which is why Firm Foundation exists. We don't need an acre to build a four-story podium building over a parking garage. Uh, I mean, the Trinity Center is amazing. I know the Trinity Center story, but we don't need to build three stories. Some faith communities might not be their jam. Uh, and so we have to create multiple opportunities to, to, to build in little pockets of surplus land. So we need 10,000 square feet, we can do 10 units. We have 5,000 square feet, we can do five units. Like we, we can multiply this dynamic. We only need 20%. So Firm Foundation went and said, what does it take to turn your no into a yes? And what we heard back was, we need someone to help us do the development. We need someone to help us find funding. We need someone to do the project management. We need someone to connect all the operational providers because churches, faith communities, you shouldn't be the one doing leases. You shouldn't be the one working through that system. You also shouldn't be the one doing the supportive services. There's people in your community already who are brilliant at that, and you should have them involved doing that work. Faith communities should stay in a lane that Penny described beautifully, which is we have land, we have a theological, philosophical uh, imperative to care and to sacrifice on behalf of others, and we have brilliant non-biological community, which is the key ingredient for rehumanizing the housing crisis. Uh, next slide. So that's how we were born. These are our uh, beginning pieces. This is six units at First Presbyterian Church of Hayward. Uh, that is my friend uh, Betty and Jojo in the upper right-hand corner. They lived in one of our first units that we did there at First Presbyterian Church of Hayward in the parking lot. Um, so many of our faith communities, by the way, you don't have to have like surplus land on grass. You might have surplus parking. And so one of our mantras was people over parking. Um, we had more than enough parking spaces, so we took 13 parking spaces and turned it into six uh, tiny homes. This original home was 186 square feet. We now build them at 260 square feet, having learned how to design along the way. But I'm telling you, almost every faith community has 13 parking spaces. And so if we can figure out how to multiply that, which is the work that we're doing, we, we're beginning to move the needle. Uh, next slide. We want to see the end involuntary homelessness folks in this call. That's the goal. And there are, there's a certain portion of our people who will choose to live on the streets. Um, but the point in time camp will tell you 90% of them want to come inside to a humanizing home, a unit with a bathroom, a unit with a shower, a unit with a kitchen, a unit that we've heard over and over again with a door that locks, uh, a unit with uh, heating and air conditioning, because we've heard over and over again, the struggle of being outside is the cold, like the biting cold nine months out of the year, even in the summer months, it still gets cold in the middle of the evening. So that's our vision. Next slide. Uh, you've heard a little bit about our work, so I'll keep it moving for the sake of time. Next slide. Oh, so many lessons, my people. I, I, I could go over this for, for hours. Um, one, we uh, learned that this is hard work. Um, SB4 is helpful but it takes um, numerous partners. It's gonna take public partners, private partners. Um, it's gonna take funding. That's gonna be a piece of the puzzle. And so that's what Firm Foundation does because uh, to Penny's point, most faith communities are land rich and cash poor. Uh, we learned that um, it's best to put the units on foundations 
Uh, that way you're eligible for vouchers. That way you're eligible for different coding structures. They're considered permanent supportive homes. We've learned that we like permanent over transitional. Um, all of that means in the coding service structure is that if you say your units are transitional, it means you have to set an end date, six months, 18 months, doesn't matter where, but it's setting an end date saying you have to move out by this date, which causes an incredible amount of anxiety with people who have been housing insecure for years. So we just say, look, there's no end date. People are gonna, we advocate for people providing housing services. So you, you might not wanna live in a tiny home forever, but if you do, you have that option. Like if you found community and you found healing and you found your place, stay. Uh, and if you're growing to a new place and you can afford a one bedroom or, or a larger, great. We're providing both by saying it's permanent. Next slide. Uh, we'll go next slide. Uh, this is also, we did First Presbyterian Church of Hayward. We did Goodness Village. We learned a lot of lessons here around what wheels, what the advantages are, what the disadvantages are. I think if we could on this project, we would have put them all on foundations, but there are so many utilities crisscrossing uh, and easements within this property that we, we just couldn't do it. Um, learned a lot about the different coding structures here. I'm kind of just giving a few options of what's possible. Uh, next slide. This was where we really began to hit our stride. Uh, we built the Fairmont Navigation Center. You can see some pictures uh, of those homes. In this one, we really tried to not design units in a solid line. Uh, we had to work with Alameda County. Um, they would have loved to have put more units on here. We felt like, uh, I think we all agreed in the end, but we felt like we can't do that and keep humanizing curves in the sidewalks and villages of you know little pockets of units facing each other. And all these trauma-informed design elements that that kind of go into the project. It's why we use brighter colors. Um, you want to really think through all that work. So we were able to build these units. We're going to do a tour here in a second by video. Um, but the other part that we learned is we learned how to do it in a pop-up factory, which means that we essentially built a factory for these units in the parking lot of this project, which saves us massive amounts of time and massive amounts of money because those are two constraints. Um, you know, your normal affordable housing bill that you understand and we're great friends with Eden and RCD and Mercy. And um, in fact, we're doing an event tomorrow night and they're all coming, uh, but it's gonna take them five to seven years to build a project and it's gonna be $700,000 a unit or more. And we just can't afford that at that current, at that current space. We have to do something different, so. Uh, next slide. So we designed our unit. Our unit is completely chapter 11B uh, accessible. We heard that we needed to be that over and over again, which means it's completely accessible for able-bodied and non-able-bodied individuals. Um, we learned how to build it back to back. It's 260 square feet. We've added some extra storage. Um, it's voucher eligible, which allows us to create an income stream, which allows us to finance parts of the project. Right, with a lot of your nonprofit funders, your CDFIs, your lists, your enterprises, um, your community development banking industry. So voucher, that's why I would advocate with Penny, the more advocation for you can do for rental subsidies, uh, that's a real key to solving this, this crisis that we're in. Uh, and let's take a tour, next slide. Oh, sorry, that's something I just told you. They're designed for permanent supportive housing. That's an important piece. Um, let's go to next slide. That's the tour. Let's do it. We're not hearing it on this end. Mike, can you make sure that you're found? I handicapped accessible. Uh, at this project that we're on here, there's gonna be 10 of these uh, and then uh, 24 more of what we call our basic unit, which is a bit smaller. I mean, I'm excited to show you this one. I think it's turned out beautifully. Let's come on in, let me, let me show you. We come in, you can look at what we would call the kitchen space, uh, mini fridge, mini freezer, stove top, microwave, sink. Again, this unit is designed to be for someone who might be in a wheelchair. So it's going to turn around space. We really wanted to design units that were humanizing. That's for a foundation. What we're trying to do is really just like miniaturize all the same amenities that we have in our home as much as possible. So you're going to find showers and toilets and come on in, let me see the bathroom. 
chance to tour the unit here at our project in San Leandro, but I wanted to also show you a bit of how these units are being constructed. It's very unique and I think pretty innovative. These are factory built California HED approved units. We're able to set up a temporary factory. We're here in the parking lot on this project. These units are being constructed at the same time the site development is happening right over here. When the units get to a certain point, we crane them from here and we move them onto that Kind of site, and that again is something to reduce construction time. So, on this project, we broke ground for these units uh, late October and are currently scheduled to finish early July for 34 of these units. But it also is able to help us to do it at about one fifth of the cost of a comparable unit in a permanent affordable housing structure. Next slide. Uh, you've heard a little bit of me talk about this. This is really important to us. Um, we do multiple peer reviews with people who are living in our units to make sure that we are building humanizing, sustainable, trauma-informed villages. Um, I think so often we make a mistake in our communities uh, of creating housing that doesn't think through the, the long term. I think there's an incredible value for interim housing if it's being built alongside permanent supportive housing. Um, otherwise, I think as advocates, we need to hold the line uh, on the creation of permanent supportive housing as well as interim and transitional housing. Uh, next slide, please. Here's just a few of the projects. This is uh, the what we're doing in Walnut Creek. We're about to break ground uh, on this one here momentarily. That is six units on like this little piece of parking lot. There was like this weird cutout parking lot section back there. Uh, that's six units and an office. This is working with Hope Solutions from Contra Costa County as the um, kind of operational partner with us there. And it is project-based voucher kind of con contracted. So this will create its own income stream. So the supportive services are going to be funded by the vouchers. And therefore, the government entity or the nonprofit don't have to keep putting money in. It's a completely financially self-sustaining village. Next slide. Uh, this is Patrick. This is 10,000 square feet. This is 10 units back to back. Like you can put them back to back to create more kind of humanizing community space and deck space. Um, we're really excited about this project. This is currently entitled. We are already, uh, now we're just working through the funding side of it, um, which is difficult. I, I do think we, like most faith communities will get stuck and most probably these projects get stuck in funding. They are too small for tax credit kind of equitable, which is the major like weapon of affordable housing. So we have to do grant funding, philanthropic funding, uh, and we're working through that and so far so good, but um, this one's waiting to get funded. Once funded, it'll be built in less than six months. So next uh, slide. This is Bancroft, this is a 5,000 square feet. This is five uh, units, a five unit project. Just wanted to give you all an example of what we can do with, you know, this is a little piece of side yard that is mostly full of mulch and trash. Um, and I think a lot of faith communities have this section where they put the shipping containers and they put the extra storage things um, and the old you know, VBS sets kind of go back here in a corner somewhere. Uh, and we're advocating to turn that into housing instead. So next slide. Uh, and this is out, um, this is actually, this design's gotten even better since I, sorry, made this slideshow, but this is out in Livermore. Um, this is now called Garden Vista, and we just submitted our planning application for this project, and we're really excited about it. Um, and, and this is going to be, again, this is with La Familia, um, same concept. We're going to work with the Livermore Housing Authority for their next RFP on project-based vouchers, which creates the income stream, which creates this, which pays the supportive services, uh, and away you go. So next slide. It takes us about 18 to 24 months 
about two years from kind of initial concept to move in. If we're moving everything along perfectly, I think Penny will tell you that not everything works like that. You end up with an arborist who needs to take a month and a half, and then you have this. Uh, but in the best case scenario, the hardest part of this is getting entitled and getting funded. It's not construction. Construction takes three months at the most, three to four months. Um, and so SB4 will be helpful, kind of immensely on this front. The next part of helpful is if um, you're all involved, you know, if you don't know heard about in the Bay or not, but we really need to pass a regional bond um, around housing. That'll be a massive lift to, to your work and our work. Um, that's coming in 2024. So uh, next slide. And we're anywhere, depending on where utilities are, you know, because you have to, you know, they're all fully powered and sewered and underground utility. Um, anywhere between 175 and 225, we might creep up to 235. That's an all-in development cost for the units that we've been building. If you start to build multiple stories, we have a couple projects like that. It just gets, it almost doubles. Like you go two stories and you're going to double these costs. Uh, and there's really no, no other way around that. But um, we, we've really worked hard to keep this cost to where it is because it, it, we can't be as a community doing $700,000 a, a unit. Um, that's not a sustainable or, or possible endeavor. Next slide. Uh, we are doing some small lot development. This is a four story project we are doing. So we have some experience with that. And there's times when it works and times when it makes sense. This is, this is 47 units in a manager unit. So 48 units on 0.5 acres. Um, just give you an idea of what kind of density is available to us. This is built modular again. And so we'll finish this project in, in under two years, maybe two years and a couple months um, from start to finish. And it'll be about $425,000 per, per unit. Um, so still significantly underneath what other big projects cost, but, but double once you go to multiple stories. So uh, next slide. Um, that's the same project you were just looking at. These are the fancy pictures. Next slide. Uh, another one we're doing it on Cherry Street, smaller one. Next slide. Uh, and this one on Fifth Avenue is uh, recuperative care, medical recuperative care. These are done on private. Um, private landowners also have surplus land. And so we're doing little pockets of projects. Next slide. Uh, you've heard a lot about what helps. I'll go next slide because I'm running out of time. Uh, and that is kind of the final piece of the puzzle for us is that's what we exist for. So if you are thinking about it with your land, we exist as firm financial community housing to be the one-stop phone call to help you work through that um, and potentially build a small village on your land. If your land is large, we will refer you because we believe in highest and best use of land. Uh, we'll refer, refer you to someone who could do a larger project, but we're primarily 40 units and down. Scene. <laughs> That's all I got. I've thrown an amen at the end. <laughs> okay, but, great. Great, Jake. Thank you so much. Um, really appreciate your uh, comments and pennies and uh, John. So we're getting near to the end of the program, and I want to just do a quick sum. So Senate Bill 4 gives our community new choices. It makes it easier for religious institutions to build housing for the unhoused, and housing for our local workforce. It can take people off the streets. For the people who work on the peninsula and live in Salinas Valley, it can also help take them out of their cars. So for Landwatch, Senate Bill 4 is part of the solution for a sustainable future. It can create housing that is both more fair, more affordable, and also more climate friendly. It's really, uh, I think, easy to despair about the state of the planet if you're following um, the uh, discussions today on uh, COP in um, Dubai. Um, but, you know, like a lot of people, I find inspiration in the younger generation, Greta Thunberg being a perfect example. She likes to talk about how getting involved in making our community better gives life to meaning uh, and I gives meaning to life. And I think that really holds uh, true for all of us on this call. We are really drawn to uh, try to make things better in some way. So I'm also inspired by those who have worked on the issues for a long time. My uh, long serving board member, Janet Brennan, she's been on the Landwatch board for 26 years, makes the point that there's no due date on hope. 
And with that, I want to thank you all for participating. Uh, thank my panelists. I see we have a number of questions which we're going to take. Uh, but before we sign off, I want to ask you to do two things. One, go to our website, the Landwatch website, and please subscribe to our newsletter. We can help keep you informed about SB4 and other topics that might interest you on housing, water, climate, transportation. We're involved in all those things. Uh, we also hope you would consider supporting us through Monterey County Gives uh, and help us make our community more equitable and sustainable and take that out to the um, broader community. So again, thank you so much. And um, Melanie, maybe you have some um, questions to pose through the chat to our panelists. Yeah, there are a couple questions in the chat. Um, one question that came up from Christian is who manages the housing and how are the funds raised? And then there's also a follow-up question about how much revenue per unit is generated for the church. So this might be for um, Reverend Jake or Reverend Penny. Yeah, I'll go. Um, can you give me the first one again real quick? I got the last one, but I want to get the wording of the first one right. Oh, who manages the house? Okay. Um, and so traditionally what we do on each project is we will we'll connect with the local service providers, whoever's doing your local case management, your local permanent supportive housing services. So Right now we have projects we're working on with uh, La Familia, First Presbyterian Church of Hayward is still doing deep services, Hope Solutions, uh, Shelter Inc. in Solano County. Um, we'll connect all those folks to so the church. They end up being the ones who really is where the, the, the deal is navigated, lease the village from the church. So the church doesn't make money per unit. They'll make money for leasing out their land. Um, it's not a huge amount. We're not trying to do it as a money maker necessarily, but we want to put it in space because there is burden placed on the faith community and uh, you want it to last for a long time. And I've learned as a pastor that even if the current pastor or current uh, rabbi wants to do something for free out of the goodness of their soul, the next one coming in might not. But if there's an income there, it, it's hard to say no to. And what was the second part of that question, um, Melanie? The second part is about the revenue per unit. Uh, it, the revenue per unit comes in from project-based vouchers, but as it goes to the faith community, it's going to take the form of a, of a land lease. So the, the faith community, we really, I don't think they want to be doing property management, rent collection, um, those kind of spaces. So we we navigate the deal that they get one lump sum from the operational provider um, per month to cover utilities, to cover any admin costs, and then as a as an income stream. Okay, great. Um, Melanie, next question. Next question. Is, so this is uh, a little bit complicated. So I'm going to try to summarize what Michael Waxer put in that the system that's currently set up in terms of how units are counted. Uh, it's a resource constraints methodology and road fees are normally calculated in. So ultimately it's difficult to deliver affordable housing. And I think the, the crux of it is how do jurisdictions partner with those that are advocating for low cost housing versus seeing themselves as gatekeepers? with this list of requirements that keeps growing for a jurisdiction. Yeah, we um, we have found to date, almost all of the staff in different municipalities from cities to counties to all the above, they want to get the, the projects built. They wanna get, they have issues too. They don't want to, I mean, it would be a huge win for a city to end involuntary homelessness in its community. Um, and, and so they're trying to do what they can. They find themselves almost always, especially just the way we've built this system, U utility districts, water districts, park districts, all charge impact fees, which make price you know, it's per unit. And, and so the struggle is from a legislative perspective um, and a, just like a local grinding policy perspective, e we got charged like in the Vallejo project, just because there's no, there's no way around it. Like the, Park District says, look, it, it's a per unit cost to build a new construction unit. And it doesn't matter if your unit is 
in a market rate, you know, 200 unit development, it, there's no variable scale there for affordable housing development in the impact fees. And, and that's probably the next round of thinking that through, but there's nothing the municipality can do about that. I mean, like there's no version of, they can, like they can get creative, like on the Fairmont navigation party, the, the sewer department said, well, we can look at it like a hotel. And if we look at it like a hotel, then we, you know, it becomes X, but it's still significant. It's not like it went away. I'll comment that um, one of the sort of uh, issues that Lance Watch has been involved in is trying to uh, get jurisdictions when they uh, adopt impact fees to do so on a per square foot rather than a per yeah, unit basis. And uh, mm -hmm. there's they also have the discretion to waive fees for uh, affordable units. And so we've advocated that as well. Um, this is a, a kind of an upstream issue that you would have to but there's plenty of opportunities for you to advocate just look for the next uh, uh planning commission consideration of the nexus impact study <laughs> it's not it's not an easy thing to get involved in but um uh you know we get involved in it and you know watch our website because we do advocate for that a follow-up question to that from Catherine kind of fits in with what you were saying john has anyone worked on SB4 projects which have not taken government funds, tax credits, housing choice vouchers, et cetera? SB4 was just passed, and I'm not aware of anybody who's actually implemented a project using it yet. Uh, but I yeah, think Jay can yet. probably speak to this. Yeah. Not yet. Um, I don't know if there's any with SB4. John, this would be a question for you. There is sometimes within SB35 and AB 2162 requirements that you you use public funds um, in some way, shape or form. But I, I don't imagine that you ha have to necessarily, unless it's specifically written in SB4. Uh, I think you could do a project, you know, if you built it completely philanthropically, like you, so this take an easy math, you do a 10 unit project at 200,000, it's 2 million. You know, if someone has 2 million and wants to build the units, um, they can do that. It's, it's the question is, how do you do the supportive services ongoing? How do you provide the case management ongoing? Where it really catches, you know, um, municipalities and, and, and governments is, is that ongoing supportive service contract cost. So if you don't want to take housing vouchers or rental subsidies, you know, and you want to have a sustainable project for 20 years, you're not, you're not going to get a contract from your local government for 20 years. Um, there's some risk there. I think we have time for one more question. Margie writes, and this is an interesting one, how much do residents pay to live in one of these units? If they're publicly funded units like voucher units, they're going to pay 30% or roughly 30 to 33% of whatever their income is. So if they're on a standard SSI you know, income, which I think is roughly $1,000, I don't know exactly what it is. It's like 990-ish. Um, they're going to play roughly 330 if they have that. If they have an income stream that looks like $300, they're going to pay roughly $100. Um, they're going to pay 33% of whatever, 30 to 33% of whatever that is. If they're not publicly funded, um, then whoever's the least, whoever's doing that project, uh, like Goodness Village can set their own rents uh, in creative ways. The Village of First Vegetarian Church of Hayward has a graduated scale that then they give back to them as part of that program when they move out into a unit. Um, but those ones are, are different. Uh, I'll go back to learning along the way. Goodness Village is a great project, but it has, because it has no voucher income, they have to raise roughly 600 to $700,000 a year in order to like support the case managers and the, and the, the staff who's, who's doing that work, which is difficult. It's difficult to multiply that. And, and I can we are into multiplication. Like how do we do 15, you, you know, 10 unit projects? Mm -hmm. So. So Melanie, I want to, um, since we still have 43 people on the line, why don't we uh, continue with questions until, uh, you know, Jake, John and Penny actually have to drop off. So let's, you know, if Jake and John and Penny are willing to take a few more. Sure, I've got 10 minutes just to- Okay, get great. So hard stop in, in 10 minutes. Um, perfect. perfect. So Melanie? Yeah, it looks like Eric has a question on liability. So insurance costs and other concerns have been a problem for churches. How are liabilities handled? Uh, they're handled 
multiple ways, one of which is the lease, right? So you require, when you have someone leasing on your property, you require that they have insurance in a general kind of lease format. Uh, and then also we haven't had a problem yet. I mean, this is tangent. All faith communities need to get their welfare exemption in order to do affordable housing on their on their property. Um, I don't know if you know how much faith communities you're aware of, but they have three different tax exemptions that we are able to get. One of which is the normal religious exemption, um, the, sorry, the church exemption, the religious exemption, and the welfare exemption. And so get your welfare exemption. That's part A. Um, and then as part of that, we have found that we added the tiny homes at the first Presbyterian Church of Hayward project, even after you have a lease kind of on their primary insurances would be whoever the operator is, we added it to our general liability and it, the cost was very minimal um, because of some of the other work we were doing. So you're essentially as the faith community double covered. Great. Christian has a question on the range of revenues for land leases. For example, five units to 30 units. Is there a difference? Yeah. I mean, it's five units to 30 units and it's faith community to faith community. Like the, the one in Walnut Creek, um, they really ended up kind of negotiating to, to roughly $1,000 for six. Uh, the five unit project, it really makes it work for the church that we saw, showed you in Bancroft. That's $1,500. It, it's roughly double that for the for the one in in Patrick, you know, like that one. The income stream is a three thousand. Um, it's probably the top end, you know. What I mean, before you start to really lose, like um, the ability to make the supportive services work, but it, it's not market. I mean, you could do more than that, you know, like if you wanted to, but um, that's probably the range at the moment. Great. The follow-up question is, what are the options of capital to raise the large amount of capital needed to construct and develop these projects? We are finding that we can finance with a construction financing or mini perm um, about 30 to 40 percent of the project, but you still need to do 60 percent of it. And then the primary sources are, are governmental. Um, like right now we're doing, you know, I'm reviewing later today with our team, uh, the National Housing Trial national housing trust fund ordinance that just came out for 30 percent ami units or lower for one of our projects that would essentially cover every cost of our unit um it's still a little bit out of the box but we, we you know we've got a home key award that we've done community development block grants awards um local just county supervisors awarding you know from their slush fund i don't know what you call it like they have their own general fund they can do things from um, then it's just been a variety of those. Some philanthropic, but not in huge amounts as of yet. Excellent. Eric has another question. Um, this is a good one on housing first edicts, uh, projects, yep. space vouchers, churches are required to adopt those. Okay. How do churches say no to certain clientele that are either of concern for safety and risk reasons and or limit the subset of residents they're willing to take on their properties? It's really up to the faith community in the in the first place. I mean, housing first, I would advocate hard for housing first, just by the math, like by the sociology of it. But if you're going to do project-based vouchers or even tenant-based voucher projects, by instantly it takes out anybody who's a sex offender on church land. Um, so you're instantly into a whole different pool. Um, I think you can, with some housing first, work with population. Like if your church really wants to serve seniors, um, but I think over and over again, you've seen housing first be effective, especially if you have the right case managers on site and the right people on site and the right village of the way it's built. Um, but that's really up to the faith community and what they feel comfortable with um, and part of what we do. You know, like we, we help people walk through what population do you really want to serve? You know, with um, Penny and St. James, it's foster to youth. Great. Let's build a village for foster to youth. For Wana Creek, it's we really want to highlight seniors if we're able. And so you work with the local referring agencies to see what you can, what you can really create. Excellent. These are great questions, folks. Keep submitting them. Uh, if impact fees, this one comes from Michael, do become based on square footage versus unit, mm -hmm. couldn't that then be defined as a social injustice since virtually all of the affordable units would then be as small as possible. 
I'll leave that one to someone else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I guess it. I would say half a loaf is better than none. I mean, the idea is to is to uh, to reduce the impact fees. Um, and this doesn't just apply in the context of affordable housing and under SB4. It applies across uh, all housing and uh, affordable housing projects need to be economically viable. And um, in order to make them viable, we want to reduce costs wherever we can. So um, I, I think that the important thing is to create incentives to build them in the first place and then perhaps not to concern ourselves about the fact that they aren't as palatial as um, um, as as market rate housing. It, it's just not practical. Great. Another question in from Diane here. What is included in the development totals, and are those numbers per unit or per square foot? No, they're they're per unit, and it's all in. It's all your hard costs and soft costs. Hard costs, soft costs, contingencies. Um. It's all included in there. Excellent. A question for uh, Reverend Penny. How do you uh, incorporate kind of this spiritual component, making sure that churches know this option is available and encouraging them to take it? Well, just, you know, through relationships, really. And then, uh, so, you know, in my work in the faith communities in San Mateo County, um, you know, just doing a lot of one-to-one -one meetings, um, going to, I went to John's uh, faith community and did a presentation. Um, and then just, it's it spreads out, right? People who know other people in the faith community then talk and really just talking like I did today about the gifts that the faith communities can bring. And there's just, there's just incredible growing momentum. And so I think as that momentum keeps going, that more and more faith communities will be asking questions like some of you on the call today. And I think that it's hopefully our job now that you know about it more to get the word out more. And that's, the, and just really talking about what our traditions teach us and our, our, what I feel is our moral and spiritual responsibility. So just trying to be inspirational about that, encouraging about that and showing people that it's possible. So, so, Melanie, I think that's a great uh, time, a great last comment. Um, again, my thanks to uh, the panelists. Uh, really great uh, information to the 37 people who are still on. Uh, thank you very much for your participation. And uh, we'll be following up with an email and a link to the recording. Um, and, you know, let's build some housing for people that really need it. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.